All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Unicorn Connector Show, where we explore the power of positive relationships and discover new opportunities for growth. I'm excited to introduce Joyce Foistel, the founder of Boomer's Social Media Tutor, and with over 50 years of experience as a connector, Joyce is here to share her insights on how to maximize LinkedIn to build relationships and achieve your personal and professional goals. Let's welcome our guest, Joyce Foistel. Joyce, please say hello and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I've re- I don't think I've ever used the phrase over 50 years of connecting people and any introduction I've ever supplied before today. But I thought I've been connecting people and promoting things since, well, high school, like 74. So if we say 50, they'd be 24. Even in college, I was that annoying kid in the dorm floor that would come around and say, you're giving butt at the blood drive. Come on, come with Joe. Joe and you, you'll come together, give each other courage, and you can do this. And, you know, my dad was like, my dad never met a stranger. He could schmooze people anywhere, anyhow, amazing. So a lot of connecting is, there's a degree of schmoozing, but genuine, not like slick, kind of, you kind of schmoozing. You know? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, I mean, I think it's such an important thing to do, connecting people. And that's one of the reasons why I love doing this show and why I'm so passionate about everything that we do. Um, because it can change the world, you know, it can change people's lives. And so I think it's incredible. I, I loved reading that because I'm like, I mean, that's amazing. And a lot of people will say, oh, I've always been a connector. I connect people just naturally, you know, but sometimes mm-hmm. you need that switch. Like it was not something I did naturally. Um, it, even just a few years ago, you wouldn't have caught me making connections for people because it just wasn't part of what I did usually. So I think it's awesome. I think it's an amazing thing. So I'm really glad that you are here today. Glad we got the connection of technology figured out because that's an important part of making connections and being on the show is getting in the same room together. So um, glad you're here. And for anybody who's watching, uh, please let us know where you're watching from. Go ahead and put it in the comments. Love to know who is there. And I also like to encourage people to put unicorn emojis in the chat because, you know, I love unicorns. And yeah, if you have any questions for Joyce as we go along, please feel free to ask. So we are going to get into it. I'm excited because Joyce is just so much positive energy. I was watching your YouTube promo video earlier, and I just love um, just how you communicate to people. So, um, So yeah, I'm excited to get into this. So Joyce, tell me, I'm curious, you know, going back in time a little bit here, how did you become a connector? Well, maybe it was growing up in a small town or actually in a farm five miles from a small town where you know people and you care about them and you're kind of automatically get connected or in our small country church, anything like that. And I see my parents volunteering in the community, connecting people with each other. And if somebody needed help, they would be pretty plugged in to know who else might be able to help them. So I think part of being a connector, I would call generosity of spirit an element of that. Because connecting with people ultimately is about doing something for somebody else to help these two people who you think really could benefit from having this relationship, they don't know each other yet. So you meet this person, you take good notes, you think about it, and you think of this other person. So sometimes you might want to ask the other person. Most of the time, the people I know are fairly open. I'm really essentially their vetting person in between. They're open to me connecting the two of them. So that's a philosophy of life is one way to think about connecting and why Why do that? Ultimately, what goes around comes around. The more people you connect, it all gets, not always, but it comes back to you, at least indirectly, that people respect you so much. And for example, when people need help with LinkedIn, they'll think of me because I did them that favor, you know, of connecting with somebody that made a difference in their life and vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that I'm sure a lot of the strengths that you have just in a personal from personality 
types of assessments have kind of helped you shape into being a connector. And so I'm curious, how how do you use your natural st- strengths to connect with others? Well, I'll go to the Clifton Strengths assessment for some language about it because I really like that particular tool where it shows you in 170 paired statements, are you more this or are you more that, this or that. It will come up and tell you your top five strengths. You pay a little extra money to Gallup, who owns this assessment tool, you'll find out all 34 of your strengths. But we'll just for now just look at my current top five strengths. So for example, I have activator. Now an activator will eventually, maybe not right away, get to that little list that says follow up, connect so-and-so and so-and-so. They will make themselves do it as opposed to never do it. So that's a piece of it. But the next three ones are probably the key parts. Every time I've taken that assessment, I've taken it four times, I have positivity. So there's this presumption these two will want to be connected. I have communication, so I'm strong in meeting people and listening to them and explaining myself to them and getting that bond going. And I'm strong at writing. So I can write a very tailored email introduction that people constantly rave about because it's not just Joyce meet Daniel. There's a back story to that too. Then another one I have is winning others over. That's a shorthand for they call it woo. So because I'm sort of unabashedly curious to find things out about, I find a lot about you already, just like less than an hour. Um, then I can use that information to help me inform how to frame like the introduction I do of you with somebody and then I do with somebody else with you. I would write it a little differently based on what I know about you. And then the, ironically, the fifth strength I have in order is connectedness. So I connect is a very curious word. When I think of it on a spiritual level, actually, a very deep level, I'm not necessarily God, but spirit, but, you know, some universal force really brings us together and helps us, I think, along with my positivity approach, see that everything does work out for the best, at least much of the time. So things happen for a reason, all that kind of thing. So therefore, I I see the possibilities for a connection in places where maybe somebody else wouldn't based on those particular strengths. Okay. Awesome. So I'm curious, you mentioned you found out a lot about me in just under an hour. Tell me about your process with, you know, maybe digging into somebody. I don't know if you do research ahead of time. Actually, that's not true. I know you do research ahead of time (laughs) before you meet with somebody. I was blown away with the amount of information that you had looked at before our first meeting, you know, and people love that. They just do. And I think it's funny when you get on a call with someone and you tell them all about themselves, right? And they're like, oh man, they're like, you really did your homework. I didn't do anything. The worst is when somebody doesn't show up. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yes, I'm curious what I, I your was, process looks like. LinkedIn is at the heart of it. Not everybody will have as detailed a LinkedIn profile as you do. So it really helps me when people put a lot of information in there. So I, that way I can go back and just look all the way through to college years, early jobs, things like that, and find out about somebody and try to, you know, try to put two and two together and start asking questions. Especially I like to start with like, why are you doing what you're doing now is a good place to start because then people are always excited to tell you about their current endeavor. And then I can look back and say, oh, look, I saw you were in whatever before. It's kind of, it was a big jump. How did that happen? So trying to piece it together to get a feel for this person, what makes them tick. Another thing to really keep in mind though, to avoid sounding like some sort of investigative reporter or the police you know, detective is to make sure that you turn the conversational ball back to that person. I struggle with that sometimes myself. And, and that your tonality is really loving and, you know, warm and curious so they don't feel like really put on the spot. So those are things I have to keep in mind, even socially, so I don't Yeah, that makes something. sense. 
And when you say turn the conversa conversational ball over, you mean like maybe let them ask some questions and have yeah. them give them the chance to learn more about you? <laughs> right, right, right. So exactly. So, or it could be precisely that, or they're, you're asking me all these questions and I feel like, oh man, Daniel hasn't talked much. So then you'll be talking about something like Toastmasters, say, which we're both in. And then you say, well, I'm in Toastmasters. I'm like, oh, wow. How long have you been in Toastmasters, Daniel? And what got you interested in that? So then we kind of slide back to you a bit. So it's a little more like a tennis match, not, you know, like too fast, you know, but there's this flow between the two people. I think that helps people feel heard and respected and, you know, that they aren't overshadowed by the other person. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So, is there anything specific that you look for in making new connections, maybe on LinkedIn or if you, you know, meet somebody at an event? Like, what is it that you look for when meeting new connections? Well, selfishly, I look for older ladies. Like, I'll say broadly, not super old, like 50, 55, you know, I'll say middle-aged. Middle, upper middle age to into their 60s or 70s. But I go into a room and I see a group of people and at a table, there's somebody who looks in that age group, especially a woman, I'll make a point and I'll go sit by her. Because that person is more likely to become my client than other people in the room. Because most of my clients are over the age of roughly 50 to 55 and then up for my LinkedIn tutoring, I should say, I didn't really explain that earlier, my LinkedIn tutoring and training there are more women than men, but I, I do still have quite a few men, even younger and men, you know? So that's the kind of person I gravitate toward. Or also if you're in an event and somebody's by themselves, maybe they're standing over by the coffee or the snack area and you think, well, they might need a friend, you know? I'll go and, you know, make myself acquainted with them, find out what kind of person maybe they're looking to meet. Now, sometimes I'll know quite a few people in that space, in that room, or, then I could direct them to that other person. So, or even just a few minutes ago, I was on my own meetup group and there were two different life coaches. So I said very boldly, I said, well, Marsha and Linda, I bet you guys would make really great buddies. Hopefully you'll connect after this. So sometimes I'm very direct like that. So it depends on the setting, but that's, yeah. that's who I look for. Okay. That makes sense. I got it. Um, so, Tell me a bit about your process when you do make introductions for people. Um, and is it different online versus in person? How does that look? Well, it's really easier online. Yeah. Uh, we'll start with that then. Because okay. going back to the LinkedIn profile, that's my bread and butter. So I get this information. I know things about each of the two people. Here's a quick example of the way you can use LinkedIn. Do you know when you go into the contact info section, of a LinkedIn profile, see on your phone, it's going to be just to the right of where, let's see if I can get you here. Here, I'm on LinkedIn with you. Okay, there you are. And so when I look there, I, I, when this, I'm looking at message. See, there's a blue, I don't know if people can see it on the screen, but it says message. And then to the right of message is someone I'm first level connected with. Then there's this whole drop down list. And in the drop down list, I can see contact info about a third of the way down. And it tells me the exact month and day and year in which you and I connected. So I often will include, especially if it's been a while, I'll say, you know, I met Daniel back in 23 when we were in this coaching group and, you know, we've been connected ever since, blah, blah, blah. So I give a context of how I know that person. And then I partner that information with my CRM my client relationship management tool, where that will tell me how did I meet that person in the first place? I doesn't also have that year plugged in there. So those two things are helpful for me. And it's easier to pull all that up, obviously, quickly in an online situation where I'm writing these two emails. And then what I'll do at the, after I have this little paragraph or two short paragraphs, I'll copy the URL from the LinkedIn profile for each of the two people and say, learn more about Daniel at his LinkedIn profile. And I do that really on purpose kind of selfishly too, because the people go, oh, my LinkedIn profile, that's right. Probably need some work. Maybe I should talk that's to Joyce. Huh? It was kind of a little trick. But um, it's 
to me, saves a lot of blah, 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 kind of extra information. So that's how I like it. Now, in person, I would, you know, just try to pull them so there's not a bunch of other people around us and say, Daniel, I really want you to meet Bob here. You know, Bob's my longtime friend in Toastmasters, and Bob Daniel just joined Toastmasters. And, you know, I, I'm thinking, you know, I was just on this podcast kind of thing with him, and he was telling me he needs people who know about XYZ, you know, subject matter expert. And the two of you, wow, I think, Bob, it'd be great if you and Daniel could talk about that. And in any other ways, you might be able to help each other out. So it's shorter, I would say. It gets to the point, just like most any kind of introduction. You yeah. know what? Here's another secret. If you want to get out of a conversation with somebody, maybe you know this one, and you see somebody coming along, you think would be, and this is all very genuine, you think would be good to talk to that person and say, hey, Bob, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you showed up because I was just talking to Daniel here and the two of you, well, you know, you see where I'm going, then I can very graciously exit. Isn't that slick? <laughs> I didn't make that up. I read it in a book called um, oh, that's the Fine good. Art of Small Talk. Deborah Fine, The Fine Art of Small Talk is the best book I've ever read about small talk, about all these kinds of sort of conversational experiences we have with people, either socially or in business. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, that's a that's a very sneaky trick. I mean, you gotta have <laughs> somebody there, right? But you can I mean, quickly- It's by divine order, usually, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you're scanning the room and you don't want the person to notice that you're scanning the room too. So it's, it's kind of- Figure it out. Either yeah. that or you tell me you have to go to the bathroom or something, you know, whatever. But yeah, I have a hard time shutting it down, especially when yeah. like somebody is just going on and on and on, you know, and it's like, yeah. well, uh, gotta go, right? And then you <laughs> are two feet away talking to somebody else, right? <laughs> always, always a special time. Um, so, and I love, it's funny, uh, I think the first meeting that you and I had was the week that I got best speech in Toastmasters. It was that same day, right? Well, the mm -hmm. last week I I was at Toastmasters. I think if they could have given me a ribbon for it, they would have for worst speech. <laughs> it did not go so well, but hey, there I have something much... called most improved Toastmaster. They'll give you at the end of maybe a few months. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's true. I didn't. I kind of forgot about that. I'm never going back though. After that, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, you and that's one of the areas that we really just hit it off was with the whole Toastmasters thing. Um, I'm curious how communication and leadership skills that you've learned at Toastmasters has helped you as a connector. Have has it played much of a role with with being a connector? I think that listening is the biggest thing. I mean, I still need to work on listening. Ask the husband of 51 years. I will say, I told you that, honey. He says, yeah, that's right. I remember now. Uh, but in Toastmasters, just to paint a picture briefly for our audience, people are giving speeches. You as the attending person have typically a little form and you're listening to that speech and making a few little notes that then you can give to that speaker afterwards to tell them what they did well and where they can improve. So you have to listen pretty attentively to give meaningful feedback to that person. So there's lots of listening and then you're listening through most of the meeting or, or if you're listening for the ahs and the ums and filler, other filler sounds, then you have to listen really well. Or last night I was at one of my clubs, the grammarian. So I'm listening for interesting phrases and words that really capture my fancy. And that's a wonderful way to lift people up too. So that the listening is a big piece of it. And then I would say this is at least indirectly related to connecting, but in Toastmasters, we also give feedback. I call it feedback with love as in not just the little notes, but say I was reviewing your speech, we call it evaluating in front. And I do this in front of the whole room of say 20 some people. And I say, well, Daniel, here's some things you did really well tonight in your speech you know, A, B, and C. And then, now here's the area where I see the most room for improvement is this particular, you know, challenge that you had. And then I come back at the end with something positive. So I think from 26 years of Toastmasters, I have gotten so that I can give very direct yet kind feedback delivered kindly. 
because of almost the osmosis of doing that week in and week out and month in and year in and year out. So there sometimes when connecting, it's more like it's more like the clarifying question perhaps than feedback. Oh, you're from Wisconsin. So did you grow up on a farm there? Or um what was, you know, what, was, what the winter is like in Wisconsin? I've never lived in a cold climate. Um, what, that, so maybe it kind of helps you think of the questions to ask. Well, the other thing too in Toastmasters, not to forget, is the, t the table topics, the impromptu speaking. So what happens then when you're good at pulling your thoughts together quickly, when you're in that conversation with someone, you don't usually have a conversational block like a writer's block like um what was that something i was thinking of that like you know of course you do as you age sometimes you know that's a factor you could run into but <clears throat> at any rate i think it helps you with that kind of repartee if you will that you have in a uh, either like like this electronically over the phone or in person you you're more quick on the uptake yeah yeah that makes sense <clears throat> And so Misty, who is one of our very supportive unicorns, she mentioned how active lis listening is very important. She loves to talk, but she's definitely learned how to listen. And it's so funny because, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it is a skill. I'm sure you're a great evaluator. I would love for you to be an evaluator at one of the Toastmasters one of these days. Um, if you ever want to a practice the speech, I'll do it for you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lady who every time she gives an evaluation at Toastmasters, I am like blown away with how just clear she articulates the feedback she's giving and just how much she's been paying attention to everybody's speech. The first time I did Toastmasters, I'm like, wow, there's so much here. I can barely write my little notes down and everyone's like counting ums and ahs and all that stuff. And it's just crazy, but it's so important to actively listen almost more than being able to speak, right? Because mm -hmm. at least mm -hmm. in a conversation, as you're connecting with people, mm -hmm. I've found that the best conversations I have with people are definitely not when I'm trying to say my thing. It's when I'm listening because I care to and mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I actually care about what they have to say. It's like the same thing that said For twice. For some but reason... I taken back to the seventies and there was a program called um, parent effective PET teacher effectiveness training, parent effectiveness training. It was based on a psychologist whose name is going to escape me at the moment, but he, it was all about the term of active listening and it, it was especially geared toward helping parents be better at being parents and using not the you word, but the I word. When this happens, you say something very factually, it makes me feel this or it impacts me in this way. Um, so that's the kind of thing that now that I think, I used to teach that. It was one of those things where you were like a licensed instructor. Can you picture me like just younger than you, say 25 years old, teaching people how to be parents and I wasn't even a parent yet? That was kind of cheeky when you think back <laughs> on that. <laughs> and they would pay me money and everything. Well, well, <laughs> that was something I hadn't thought about lately. That's funny. Yeah, I love that. It is funny. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, sometimes you need an outsider's perspective, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. yeah. And some of these concepts were, you know, really timeless. So you just had to yeah. learn them. Yeah. Right. So how do you, we, we're kind of talking a little bit about some of the in-person interactions. How do you then go about connecting with people um, through LinkedIn after maybe you've met with them in person? Do you wait at all? Are you pretty quick to making that connection? Do you have any sort of process with that? Oh, I'm that glad like? you asked that question. Everybody handles that differently. Typically, if I'm in a group like I was just yesterday in the speed networking, we get two minutes with each other, one of those kind of things. And then we go through like four rounds of that. I will, I will look them up even while we're talking or, and I will send them a LinkedIn invite, even possibly during the meeting if there's a slight break or right afterwards. I will do that rather than email them because okay. that's the way I think it's simpler to get started and be very bold, take the initiative 
And then after they accept, then I have my calendar, my Calendly. I have that up as a tab always open on my computer. And then I send them the link. Well, now we're accept, we're connected. Let's find a time to, you know, I, I ask them, oh, well, like in a speed network, I say, where do you live? Oh, it turns out they're in the same suburb of Denver I'm in. So then I'll say, here, I'll send you the calendar connection. Let's find a coffee shop and get together. So there were four people I talked to and three I'm scheduled with. This was as of something that took place between one and two yesterday afternoon. So I just jump right on it. Must be the activator in me. Yeah. That, that's all, that's my approach is reach right out directly. Yeah. Well, and I mean, when you only have a couple minutes like that, mm -hmm. I feel like there's, there's a, there's an equation here, uh, maybe like a connection fizzle equation, right? The amount of time you spend in that initial conversation will determine how much time it takes for that connection to fizzle out. I just made this up. But, yeah, um, I mean, it's hard to gauge. You know, sometimes those are kind of artificially structured situations, but um, I, it's hard, you know, that may be true to a degree. But I, I well, asked them, or you could just head it off, right? And yeah, it's yeah, like, and then you just know they want to talk to you. Um, some, you know, in the past, I'm uncomfortable asking people if they want to communicate, say, through Facebook, because that to me feels way too personal. Um, even Instagram too. So the nice thing about LinkedIn, and one of the reasons I like it in so many ways, is because it feels safe. It feels appropriate. It feels professional. So it doesn't feel weird, I, I don't think, either. So that I feel people aren't put off by me sending them. Now, there's plenty of people I've met over time that I have yet to hear back from on LinkedIn. Part of it, I think, is there's a lot of people don't use LinkedIn that often. So they, they don't think to go there. So I will say to the person, oh, I'm going to send you a LinkedIn invite. I hope we can connect. Or I might private chat them, like in a Zoom meeting. Say, watch my LinkedIn invite. And I always, when you, you know, when you get to put that signature block in where you have, you know, your name, your email, your website and such, I always have my LinkedIn URL and my one-to-one -one, uh, through Calendly so they could pick that up and then set it up. You know, they can reach to me, too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I know that through your company, you do both Facebook uh, social media support as well as LinkedIn. So how, how do you do that differently between Facebook and LinkedIn? Cause you're kind of saying Facebook's more for personal stuff. I connect with people professionally on Facebook, maybe because I use all of my social media for professional purposes but i also have fun with it on all platforms so oh well, um, yeah yeah curious how the two differ in your mind let's start with facebook i and i want to clarify don't my whole world is helping people learn how to fish so to speak learn how to use linkedin effectively on their own i don't do any social media management posting none of that this is i train them how to do it themselves or I help them i coach them and the same with facebook there, I'm helping them with their Facebook business page. So one of the first things I do with a new client, like I did with this artist friend of mine the other day, was I liked her page. I liked her Facebook business page. You know, she already knew her, so we were friends on Facebook. So I wouldn't, with a brand new person to me, I wouldn't necessarily friend them. Maybe we get into a couple of sessions, it's now a client, and I would um, ask them, yeah, maybe we could be friends on Facebook. That'd be kind of fun. They're like, oh yeah. Or if I really feel that, like you and me, I mean, a really wonderful bond. I, hey, what do you think, Daniel? Is it all right to be friends on Facebook? Oh, yeah, well, sure. So I have a couple thousand friends on Facebook, maybe 2,200, somewhere in there. So I certainly have plenty of people I very tangentially know who I'm on Facebook with. But LinkedIn, I have between 10 and 11,000 connections, yeah. which um, let's move over to till then. So, so, so with Facebook, I help them basically get their page set up. And think about ways to draw from maybe their LinkedIn, um, I mean, Facebook friends to encourage them to be um, followers or likes of their you know business page. Now with LinkedIn, thinking about for myself and what I advise people, how many connections should you have? There's no magic number. I think it depends on the nature of your work and also your own personality. So, for example, me, who, as you can tell, extrovert off the chart in every possible way, I'm fine with connecting on LinkedIn with somebody I don't even know. 
if they look like they would be a good person for me to help, might want it, not necessarily for paid purposes, but even just to see my on my LinkedIn post, or maybe they know somebody because they see my LinkedIn post, they see, oh, well, that Joyce, I see her posting about this, maybe, maybe uh, she could help this friend of mine with it. And so I'm, I, I'm not what they call a lion, like a LinkedIn open networker. I'm close to that. I do. There's people, though, that a lot of people want to sell me things. And I don't want those people. So I have blocked probably in the neighborhood of seven or 800 people. So if someone comes wow. after me, I'm going to get you to a six-figure income, anything like that. I I don't just ignore them. I block them because I don't want to ever hear from that person again. I just don't have an interest in them. So I just want to clarify, I don't accept everyone. So yeah. then I help that person if they have only, I'll say, maybe a couple, 300 connections, and they think, well, isn't that enough? Well, depending... I think if you could have another 100 or 200, it would help. Then I show them how to go to search and use the tools, the search filters, and the kind of people they want to meet. And this is very painstaking. And you find them and you see, oh, they're connected to Daniel. Well, listen, I'm going to um, I'm gonna ask Daniel if he'll go back again to the email introduction. So that's how that will also come up sometimes is... Uh, where I see that's a tool you can use. That's when you're, that's your leveraging the people you already know on LinkedIn to help you expand your world to meet some more people. Cause you know, maybe you're at a party and you, and, or, or like say a chamber after hours and you see a realtor and you know, they probably know some mortgage people. And you're like, I'm really looking for mortgage people. And I, I, I looked this guy up here on LinkedIn. I saw his name, his name tag. Would you introduce me to this mortgage guy? You know, so that would be kind of comparable there. Interesting. I would I would venture to guess that most people don't actually use that part of LinkedIn. And it's such a great way to build relationships with people who are mm -hmm. in, this, in your industry or in an industry that you're focused on, whom mm -hmm. you haven't met, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's great. And what do you encourage people who maybe they're, you know, not working with you, but watching, what do you encourage them to do in order to make this happen? Well, I would say go to the search box, type in a name, like for maybe say business coach, put a quotation mark before business and after coach. So hopefully the two words come together in their profile. <clears throat> so you have that and then you, there you have it, <coughs> the words and you go down and click on see all results. Now you will see a whole bunch of little like bubbles at the top of the screen, um, but words and bubbles, I should say. So click on people. So you're searching people. You're not searching companies or jobs or anything, just people. That will narrow the number of little words and bubbles to be like connections, location, current company. So then you could say, okay, I want to make some new friends. I'm going to click on connections. I'm going to click on two because first, well, you know, most of those people. So that's cool, but let's, Let's expand our world here. So click on two. So, oh, I want them to be in um, Phoenix, Arizona. So then you go to Phoenix, Arizona, and you have, so you have this search term, business coaches. Um, they're not my connection yet, but there's at least one person between the two of us. And then you go to like Greater Phoenix or whatever it has. Now, there's, I think a lot of people can know what that means, but there's another section called all filters. So in all filters, you can go down and see industry. Maybe they coach in the IT field. They're business coach for people that work in IT. So you go down to healthcare, maybe. Then there's service categories. So it relates to things like HR or marketing. And here's a cool one. There's the very first one, I believe it is, this connections up. Well, I think Joyce knows a lot of business coaches and I'm connected to Joyce. So I'm gonna put her name in there and then that will filter these people who live in Phoenix, your second level, that Joyce may know that they're in Phoenix, which is kind of interesting. So I think it's playing around with those filters. And I want to stress to everybody watching this, these are all free tools, all free. Now, if a person is heavy into B2B sales, business to business, they may want to invest in something like Sales Navigator because that gets them into um, more discrete filters even, like how long have they been with a company? How long have they been in the field? How big is a company? 
But I think just the basic filters are a way to use to expand. Or the other thing, go to somebody's um, profile, and if they allow you to see their connections, this is a, it's a, this is going to be a first level connection. See who they're connected to. I, I did it that way back in the day. Just goes around, you're like, oh, I know Sally, and I know Kirsten, and I, I know, I'll, I look at all these people, and then you just reach out to them. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I think that's a great point. And one of the things, uh, I'll do that on occasion and look at who someone's connected with. And there seems to be a common theme, right, of all mm -hmm. the people that I know and then all the people that we have a mutual connection with. And then it's like, oh, there's something here related to this, right? And mm -hmm. like this just happened a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, hey, you're connected with this guy, Brian and Cheryl and so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. I'm like, we need a chat because I love those people. And I think that if you're connected with all of those people and those are our mutual connections, I think we're going to have a great conversation. And we did. And it was that. That is so forward. smart because a lot of times we just collect people along the way and then we forget about it. But if you in the process of that kind of searching or just thinking of such and such a person, like I want to just look up their connections, then that's, you're right. It's time for coffee or lunch or a zoom visit let you know we met was it a year ago and what's happening lately so you're deepening that relationship with that person you already know so when you think of connecting with people so i think a lot of times we think about it at the beginning stage of the relationship but there's that reconnecting and reconnecting and you know really nurturing those relationships that are so important to us on so many levels yeah absolutely well and if you do meet somebody new that you have mutual connections, sometimes you focus on all your discovery questions, right? To try to build that rapport. Well, what about using your mutual connections? Like, hey, I noticed you're connected with this person. How long have you known that person, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I love mm -hmm. them. And it's like, why? Tell me about how you guys met. And before you know it, yeah. sometimes, you know, like we met through Jack, right? And we, right. you and I actually did this. We spent probably 10, 15 minutes talking about Jack. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Is that not right? I'm pretty sure we did. That's and right. <laughs> yeah, and it's just, it's such a good conversation point, I, I feel like. So, um, oh, so I have yeah. another little, another yeah, thought. Um, if you ever want to help make that something like that happen in the project section of your profile, you say you and I put a conference on together and then there was two other people that were there that were, we were a team. We were the conference planning team. So you could, either of us could create any of the four of us, a project called, you know, planning team for conference ABC. And then what we do is we put each other as creators, co-creators essentially of this project. So down the road, someone finds my profile and they're looking at me like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I saw Daniel there. I know Daniel then that's sort of like, how do you know Daniel? Um, because we do this thing together and they'll say, I mean, there's a guy very big in Rotary here in Denver. I did a project with him. There's a woman, she's retired now, but she worked very heavily with a senior community here in Denver. I did a project with her. So it's kind of like name dropping, but not in a fake way, you know, it's very genuine. So I think that's, uh, we probably don't have too much time to get into the profile part, but that's a good use of your profile also when you're tagging people like after this man there's all kinds of pr i can do for you and the show and so you always want it what they call it mentioning on linkedin it's the same concept as tagging on linkedin i mean on facebook or instagram or twitter so you want to reference the people that have made something happen that you were part of and that's very broadly stated so people you should know you can do that on linkedin just like the other social sites yeah yeah that makes sense and i think that's a Great piece of, of advice. Projects. I don't even know what you're talking about there. And I'm well, I'm here's where you find them. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you. You go to the top part of your profile, and there's right next to like open to where it talk like if you're looking for a job or something, there's a little bubble that says add profile section. Add mm -hmm. profile section has got three parts to it. It's got core, recommended, and additional. And if you click on additional, you're going to see about eight different kind of, I'll call them specialty sections from volunteering to um, honors and awards, organizations you're in, and projects is one of them. That's where you can find it. 
you have to really know where to look because it's not um, intuitive. Okay, got it. Well, and having things like that will make your profile stand out. I'm curious what yep. other areas you would suggest people focus on on their profile like if they like when you start working with somebody i'm sure mm -hmm. there are certain things that you jump to and you say okay well, this is your first thing that you need to focus on i'm sure it's different for everybody but what's like well, the, the most important areas i would say your picture your picture is number one and you and have a great you know, picture don't i and you're the one that really pushed me into it and i wasn't quite ready and, and i'm going to tell you a really cool trick here so whenever you're on your app and you want to not just have a, a fun picture like mine is, if I can see this all, maybe they can. Then if you click on that picture of you, then you can add a, what do they call it? A profile video. Ooh, ah, you create that through the LinkedIn app and your 30 seconds of your personality is shining through. Whenever I show people that, when I do a training, everybody's just like grinning from ear to ear because it's a little over the top. And that's not everybody's ready to do that, but the picture and then the background image is so important. That's like your branding, that's like say part of your website. So these are people who have their own businesses or even if you work for somebody else, but then the headline, you have been running my headline here under the, there it is right there coming across. So think about how you want people to know you. What are the search engine optimization terms you want to be known for? Like for me, baby boomer specialists, business owners, all of that. That's really critical. And then the about section, which is so hard to write without sounding braggy, yet you need to be your biggest cheerleader. So I help people to frame that in ways that are more sharing of themselves in a genuine way without being braggy. Now, I think the featured section of LinkedIn, which has been around for, gosh, I think three years now, is really a lovely way to make a profile also just pop out. And here's why you have images, you have like this great, um, beautiful design of, for this program. And I, that's, people are going to see that when I talk about this experience and then feature it, it's going to live right there, like a, in a carousel almost. You can have one and up to three display at a time. And how do you feature something? Back to our friend, add profile section. Add profile section, you click on recommended and then you click on featured. And you can start to feature posts and articles and links to landing pages and PowerPoints, so many things that you can provide education there as well as kind of a PR um, dimension to it. Those are some things that are, are really important. And to whenever you go to experience, really not use the whole 2000 characters necessarily, but really in a very robust way, describe what you do and put your leadership roles in there too, because then people can recommend you for that and it's PR for the nonprofit. So I think people sometimes do short shrift of it, especially the current position. You know, you see all this other information, like when they were trying to get a job and they get the job, they say nothing. Okay, well, what are you doing now? And then and to go fill out some of those other bottom ones, I think is important. And the recommendations, that's the other thing. Mm. Don't, don't be shy. I, I'd recommend you in a heartbeat just doing this time together. It's awesome. So that's what I'll, I can recommend you. And that I say, says a lot. When P and then you all can take snippets of that recommendation or some other love note you got somewhere from person not even on LinkedIn with you. You can put that stuff up in your in about or in, actually with each of your positions. So it's that social proof. We think of social proof like Pinterest or something when my daughter is getting married and wanted to make sure everybody was, you know, the right kind of person for her or the Google reviews. But on LinkedIn, you can do a lot of social proof too. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I only recently started asking for those recommendations and because somebody sent me one or sent me a request to recommend them. And I was like, yeah, 100 percent. And I I put my heart and soul into those things. When I mm -hmm. when I write them up for somebody, I light them up. So if you you know, if, if anybody asks me for one and I don't do it right away, it's because I'm going to take the time to do it well, you know, to do it right huge yeah it's, i mean that's like a personal review are you kidding me that's amazing mm -hmm. so i love oh. that you suggest that and i'm sure you encourage people to go through and ask people for recommendations so oh yes that's, 
and I have to remember to do it myself. Sometimes I do it better than others. So yeah. a lot of times what I'll say is, would you write me a Google review and would you write me a LinkedIn recommendation? You can use the same verbiage, right? Yeah. So the, I leaning is, I like to get LinkedIn recommendations. They mean a lot to me, but I could, I have far more recommendations than I do Google reviews. So that's, that's something I like to get as well. Yeah, that makes sense. I, mm -hmm. I can see that. Um, okay. So oh, I was going to ask, yeah, it was something with the featured section. Um, you know, I, so what I did with my featured section, we have a whole unicorn DNA and I did a post with that and just explained, these are the kind of people I like to connect with and work with and have in our community. And I have that featured on my profile. I won't ever remove that. I might change. I might update mm -hmm. it to a different post, but that just seems like such a good thing to have on your featured section is who do I want to work with? Right. And it's exactly. written in a way of like, these are the kind of people I want to connect with and work with and know and all that. And so I think that the featured section is awesome. One more thought I wanted to bring up. I think we still have time for just one more topic is creator mode, which has yeah. been out for maybe two years now. So creator mode free again, when you have creator mode, very easy to enable. It's right there toward the top. You just click on a button and it goes next. And then you have these five hashtag terms that you can use that appear right under your headline. So that also helps with your connecting with people because it's very quick way for them to see, oh, look at that. I didn't know that part of them because maybe for just for space reasons, you couldn't go into it all in your headline. So this now you've got these five hashtag terms. Furthermore, as you go down, not really right below it almost, you have a link to a hyperlink to your website or anywhere really on the internet you're trying to direct people. So that will make them easy quickly to go over and check out your website. It also says how many followers you have. You have a substantial number. So that's important to people if they're picky about it, whatever. And all of that is there. You can even have a LinkedIn newsletter, which is a cool thing, and have LinkedIn Live like this. So it's very many, there's a lot of cool, or not a lot, but there's some very powerful features that are associated with having your creator mode enabled. Yeah, actually, so I love that you mentioned that because that was what I was going to ask about was creator mode. Because um, you need to have it on for the featured section, right? No, no, no. Those are completely separate. Oh, Okay. Yeah. Don't you need a and certain number somebody, of connections? I, I've heard that somewhere. Somebody said that. No, they're they're completely separate. Okay, got it, got it. My background's getting all crazy over here. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, cool. So, yeah, that's that's funny because that was the question that was kind of lingering in my head. Um, mm. All right, so let's see. What would you say? I mean, honestly, I could probably spend all day here with you and we should we should do we gotta wrap up right <laughs> what what would you want to leave people with what are some most important things that you would suggest people do to maximize their impact as a connector on linkedin and just in general well i would say it's not about you it's about the other person and when you're posting on linkedin and you're thinking who to connect with think well, now that I know this person, who else could they know? You know, how I'm not just connecting with them randomly just so I just have another connection on LinkedIn or someone in my database. Where where could I direct this person? What group might they like? Um, what service are they seeming to look for that perhaps I can recommend somebody? So you're thinking of it from that generosity of spirit. You're always coming from that orientation. Also, it really helps to be organized and to have take notes, take that information and keep it, say, in some kind of a CRM or um, wherever you store information, however you do it. It depends on the person, how you want to handle that information. So I think that helps you when you go back and look about somebody. When you're doing those introductions, as I said, how I meet this person, how long have I known them? It puts somebody in a context you know, of your life. It, it, it helps a lot. Those are two of the main things. And I think that positivity, sort of assume that the person will want to spend time with you is hard when you're kind of shy. 
you know, to think, well, I don't know if I really should reach out to that person. I don't know about a LinkedIn connection or I kind of wanted to meet them, but I, I'm not sure it's okay. I've even felt that way. There's this like force of nature lady here in the Denver metro area who's uh, anti-ageism and I've been following her and she made a comment on one of my posts. I thought, well, actually she's tracking with me. And then I reached out, I said, could we have a Zoom? And we did. And then because of that, I helped her to um, associates at her business with LinkedIn. But I, I wasn't going after for a business. I simply wanted to get to know her better because I admire her a lot. So sometimes I think we might hold ourselves back and say, oh, I don't think they, you know, little old me, you know, um, know you're worthy of being connected to people and that people are going to be interested in you just like you're interested in them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I also wanted to mention before we do wrap up your golden connection. And I think this is important because one of the main things about stating who somebody's golden connection is, is putting it out there, right? Because, and mm -hmm. I'm, this is part of what my speech is about on Saturday is that you need to put it out there or you're never going to find them. Right. So I always like to highlight that. And what you just said kind of ties into it is, your golden connection being a service-based business coach who works with leaders of companies that could benefit from LinkedIn training. And I mean, mm -hmm. you've done an excellent job here. And, you know, I haven't done one of these specifically about LinkedIn. I should do one on how to use a green screen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that everything that you've shared today is just incredibly valuable. Um, so a couple other things I wanted to shout mm -hmm. out because... I think that you have so much value to give and want to make sure that people know um, you've got an event coming up, right? Tell us about this LinkedIn event that you're doing at Colorado Free University. Yes, we have an entity here in the Denver area. It used to only be in-person classes. One of the blessings, if you will, of COVID, to the extent we can call them that, is so much more has gone online. So the class I teach, it's called you. Um, use LinkedIn to grow your business is on, better double check this here in my calendar, is I want to say May, it's coming up in about a month, May the 17th, and it's from 6 to 9 p.m. Um, all of a sudden I lost you here. Oh, there you are. 6 to 9 p.m. on the Wednesday night. And if people, uh, you know, they could just contact me, you know, to get the link to register, it's $61. I think a three-hour class, that's a pretty good bargain for what you, you, yeah. you want to learn A to Z, soup to nuts, whatever you want to call it. Plus, you can network with people. And so people can come for, from wherever to this class and really get – I have a, about a 50-page handout that I um, also use as part of the class. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, so definitely connect with Joyce if you want to learn more about that. Um, and Joyce, you don't even know this, but we created a link to make this easy because sometimes it's so hard to type in all those numbers and things. But if you go to JoyceLIClass.UnicornUniverse.io, it'll take you to the page. So just yeah. want to make sure that Thank that's... Thank you. I like there. that. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate that. Try to make things easy for people, right? So, yeah. Yeah. And um, okay. And then one last thing, because mm -hmm. I think this is also very important. And Joyce... How long have you been doing Toastmasters, real quick? 26 years. 26 years. Okay. Yeah. I mean, well, I joined, let's do the math right. 1997, January. 26 awesome. years. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, I wanted to mention your dream that you shared to give a oh, TEDx right. talk. Yes. I love that. I absolutely <laughs> love that. And again, similar to the Golden Connection thing all about putting it out there into the universe. Mm -hmm. If you have enjoyed what Joyce has shared, how she has shared it, and just her passion for connecting people and helping people, um, reach out and maybe connect her with somebody that can get her invited to a TEDx talk. Have you done one before? Oh, no. No, I've applied, but I haven't. And, and I think part of it is the time isn't quite there yet. Because I, I have to find, A, a topic that really resonates with me that changes the world. You know, there's a catchphrase. I'm blanking on the exact word. Makes a big difference. And I'd have to find a venue that had a theme for that venue, for that TEDx, 
that tied into where I felt that I had a talk that would be of import, that would matter. So the dots haven't all connected yet. Well, that's the beauty of being connectors is connectors connect mm -hmm. the dots. Yep. And maybe there's a project for us, right? I mean, mm -hmm. why not put on a TEDx event ourselves? You and me, let's do it. <laughs> it could be done. I've that seen them really niche. <laughs> yeah, I don't know exactly how they get that license. And I figure yeah. here's the other thing to end with, since I'm only 74 years old, I figure I've got a good 20 years or more to get that project taken care of. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I love it. Well, um, Joyce, I really appreciate your time. And for anybody who wants to connect, Joyce Foistel, F-E-U-S-T-E-L. I went off my memory on that. And um, <laughs> I think it's such a cool last name. Um, so yeah, so definitely connect with Joyce. You got the link in the banner. And I think you are amazing. I really appreciate you sharing your information with everybody today. And so yeah, have an amazing day. And thank you for thank tuning you. in for everybody watching. And we'll catch you on the next one.